Uh, Exode is a sci-fi novel by a very French-sounding French man called Jean-Marc Ligny. Uh, the book is also in French. <laughs> I am far from fluent in French, so this video is not quite a book review, more a set of navel-gazy reflections on my experience reading in a language I kind of know. That said, might as well uh, fill you in on the book's premise. It takes place in the apocalyptic post-climate catastrophe wasteland we all dread, where nature has nearly given up on life. States have collapsed, replaced by local strongmen, bands of ne'er-do-wells and general hyper-individualistic chaos. Not anarchy, that's something else. Uh, most people are refugees, and the rich have escaped into their lovely air-conditioned dome cities, because of course they have. We follow the journeys of a mother and her two boys escaping from Venice after its collapse, trying to find a doctor to help the youngest. A faithful member of this pseudo-Christian UFO cult in southern Spain, struggling to cope with her abusive alcoholic husband. Their son, turned drug-addicted arson cultist. And a Norwegian couple, trying to sail to solace in the distant Kerguelen archipelago. All converging on the domed Swiss enclave of Davos, where a genetician has been tasked by his anonymous superiors with solving mortality on an absurdly short timescale. Reading Exod was unsurprisingly not undepressing, but there was always something about it to keep me coming back, however slowly I read. At first there was the language nerd aspect, uh, the sheer novelty of jumping into a book where I didn't know what a third of the words on page one meant. At this earlier stage I was definitely beginning to be invested in the characters and their stories, but the main draw was discovering and looking up all these new cool sounding words, like bayas, mifiance, décombre, gavossi. I have the book open in one hand while the other furiously typed something into Wiktionary once or twice a sentence. After not very long, this became quite an exhausting and annoyingly painstaking way of reading, ostensibly for fun, so I mostly stopped doing that. Instead, I took the dive in at the deep end approach. Just read. And if you don't understand a word or phrase, skip over it and let context guide your understanding of the narrative. This largely worked pretty alright, but it's a useless method of learning vocabulary. <laughs> the gist can't give you specific details. It can tell you that a certain noun is related to ships or weapons or whatever, but beyond that you have to guess. It can't help you remember the difference between écrouler and accroupir when both kind of make sense in context. And when you finish a chapter, chances are you've already forgotten which words you wanted to look up, so they remain lost and drifting in the infinite haze of language. Progress through the book was at its slowest at this point. I basically used it as a way of not being on the internet while I waited for the washing machine to finish, and I was hardly a daily visitor to the campus laundrette. Quite often I'd read aloud as if physically forming and hearing the sentences would help me comprehend them more deeply, or better internalise the language as a whole. More often than not, the extra mental effort of doing the accent meant I was paying less attention to what was actually being said. Maybe it's helped my pronunciation, prosody, fluency of speech, whatever, but like, how should I know? It's not like I actually ever used the language. My last method to appear was to have a real, physical, heavy French dictionary open as I read. Either the extra time it took to look for new words would make the process longer and the story harder to follow, or, ideally, it would incentivize me to actually use my brain and do some context-based detectiving when I got lost actually much more feasible than I made it out to be, only looking up words when absolutely needed. The reality was somewhat different. I got used to basically skipping over bits I didn't understand, so that habit continued. But then every so often I remembered I could look things up in progression ground to a halt. All that is to say I don't know whether I think Exide is a good book. In terms of quality of prose, that's something you need to be really seeped in a language and its stylistic norms to really comment on. I thought it seemed pretty good, though, uh, like with most authors, Jean-Marc has his pet phrases that he keeps coming back to. Everyone has yeux écarquillés when they're surprised. Ruined buildings and infrastructure, of which there are a lot, are consistently calcinés and full of pont de mur. And there are these somewhat slangy terms that everyone seems to use in any context. Bouffé for manger, bled for village. But for all I know, he isn't being lazy or formulaic, and all these phrases are simply as ubiquitous in French as they would seem. I really enjoyed most of the characters, they all felt thoroughly distinct and well-defined, acting and developing in believable ways. While the folks outside the dome do do a lot of murders, often of relatively harmless, normal people, you get why the society they found themselves in would result in that becoming commonplace. And you equally understand why the people agitating our protagonists and becoming murdered would be drawn to doing such things, even though it's all clearly morally bankrupt. The differences between dome dwellers and so-called outers are made extremely clear, not only in terms of their material circumstances and what they see as normal, but culturally, in their attitudes, how they speak, how they carry themselves. This is made ten times more stark when our enclave-bound and outsider protagonists finally begin to meet up, and the disdain one group has for the other, well-meaning though it may attempt to be, is just so cringe, so over the top, 
so believable in context it's enough to give anyone's mum a fit of class consciousness. The one character who didn't click with me was Risten, wife of Olaf, the Norwegian sailors. The two of them have all the same life experience, growing up in the same town, roughly the same age, but it's always him who's sensible, cautious, competent, stoic. Well, she's the naive one, afraid of everything, who never makes any real decisions and quite likes the quaint, peaceful town they stop off at, despite the fact that everyone there is a blatant, unashamed, flag-waving Nazi. Ristan has next to nothing going for her, beyond these definitely bad stereotypes. Come on, Jean-Marc, I know you can write good female characters. That said, the highlight of this couple's story is when they sail over what used to be Denmark and the Netherlands. Genuinely haunting stuff. I'm not good at picking out themes, but this book definitely had some. Our geneticist, Pradesh, is working at slash for somewhere slash some organisation called Darwin Alley. I never quite figured it out. And the whole survival of the fittest thing is just everywhere in this book. The casual murder and betrayal that goes on outside the Davos Enclave is one of the main symptoms of it. When resources are few and drying up, and interpersonal trust is barely even a concept anymore, this horrific Darwinian ex-society is all that remains. But it's not just some natural result of ecological collapse, and not everyone's subject to it. It's perpetuated by the rich in their enclaves, because of course it is. While they are definitely running out of resources like everyone else, they still have far more than their fair share, in terms of food, technology, security, sheer space, and they refuse to let in more than one or two tokens from among the starving masses camped against their walls, plus a few black marketeers. Feel free to draw any number of comparisons. But it's not even the fault of the rich as individuals. They just have to play by the rules defined by the enclave system and violently enforced by its authorities. And the immortality technology Pradesh is developing won't even be going to all the privileged enclave dwellers, but like a hundred billionaires so they can jump off Earth and go to this nice new planet they just found leaving everyone else for dead. Survival of the fittest is bogus, it's all just survival of the money, capitalism, blah blah blah. The other big theme I noticed, and have far less to say about, is this searching for paradise thing. Mercedes, the UFO cultist, is literally a member of Los Niños de Paraíso, constantly looking forward to being beamed up to the Garden of Eden. Olaf and Riesten are sailing to find their heaven on Earth somewhere, temperate and unspoilt. The planet those hundred billionaires are heading to is literally called Eden, and the title of the book? Sure, it's full of stories of people upping sticks and looking for refuge, but there's no getting away from the fact that it is a biblical title. Exodus being the story of the Israelites beginning their journey into the land of Canaan, a land of milk and honey, a picture of heaven on earth. I guess the conclusion to be taken from this theme is basically a dystopian one. At the end of the book, needless to say, no one achieves this. There's also stuff about self-delusion in the face of crisis. There's the fact that the scientist's chaotic teenage daughter is called Pandora for some reason. There's the Boudfeur arson cult, who literally want to watch the world burn. So given all that stuff I was able to say about the book, the uh, <coughs> review I appear to have just given it, would I say that I get it? Well, not completely. Given the language barrier, the amount of mental effort I have to put into directly making sense of the words on the page, I was always going to get less out of it in every sense. There are definitely subtexts, cultural references, little jokes I didn't even register. There will have been bits of dialogue and narrative I just straight up misunderstood. Threads I didn't pick up on because I was too busy checking definitions. And it's frustrating that I can't give examples, but logically I can't. There are so many parts of the book that just washed over me because I was getting lost in the words and couldn't stand back and look at the picture they were painting. The ideas which the story brings up aren't exactly new, but are they at least handled in a deft and effective way? Probably. I don't know. I was too busy marvelling in the fact that I was able to get through a book in not English. Did I know French before I started reading Exode? Well, I used to, as a very, very small child, as much as you would expect any very, very small child to know. I forgot most of it, then studied it up to GCSE in school. I barely practised it since then, certainly not in terms of actual conversations. And since reading Exode, uh, sure, I now know a couple dozen more words, and I am relatively fluent at reading Jean-Marc Ligny's style specifically. But what about an apparently more serious author like Sartre or Baudelaire, or I don't know, someone like that? Probably not and I'm really slow at speaking it, constantly second-guessing my grammar, and I'm no good whatsoever at understanding the spoken language. But any language is as vast as its body of speakers, and as much as I don't know all of French, I definitely don't know all of English. All the little quirks used at different times, by different subcultures in different places, all the distinct sets of denotations and connotations each speaker produces in their own head, all the ways it has and continues to interact with other languages through code-switching and borrowings, all that applies to any number of languages. I don't know French, or know English, in the same way as, like, a marine biologist doesn't know the ocean. But it turns out I know enough of it to read a book! And I enjoyed that book. Merci pour le cadeau, Zachary.